May we then turn to item nine on the agenda, which is the performance report, and I'll invite Paul Bauman to introduce it, please. Thank you, Martin. So clearly it's standing in for Bill as the compare of this particular um, stand-up comedy routine as we go round the table with various contributions. Um, the overall assessment is shown on page three, and I would say as I go through this, I will be jumping between the main text that you've got here and then the PowerPoint annexes behind it. So for those of you with paper, that's easy. For those of you who are technologically enlightened, that's slightly more challenging. Um, but anyway, we start with table two. Um, as we've commented before, one of the snags that we've got at the moment is that the most important data for us, which is the outcomes data, the patient outcomes data, experience, all the rest of it, um, is coming through in dribs and drabs, but on the whole will not come through until the usual lags work their way through. So we've actually got a relatively thin set of measures that we can discuss at this point. Uh, as the report makes it clear, we are continuing to work with the Office for National Statistics to see if there's some way of cutting down the lag between things happening and outcomes being reported, but uh, more of that at a subsequent report. But going back to table two, I thought I'd just quickly whiz down the set of measures and things that you have there. Um, starting with priority one, you can see that uh, there are a series of measures, and I would draw your attention in this particular instance to pages two to four of the presentation in section A, which is behind the main report, and then perhaps invite Jane to say a few words about friends and family test implementation, and perhaps more importantly, the results that are starting to emerge on that. I'm struggling with the technology to find pages two to four, but um, and in fact, the slides are wider. Um, I mean, Tim, Tim can do, we can do a bit of a double act if we need to. I think what's been really important with FFT is not only have we seen an increase in the numbers of, of um, people that have responded, but also are getting some very, um, some very good feedback around what's happening actually at the front line in the world or actually where these patients are being cared for. Um, with, with staff really looking at a very granular level about what, people, about what FFT is telling them about their particular ward or their particular department, and now, more recently, about their maternity service. So they, we are beginning to see a fair bit of you said we did or um, to try and address some of, the, some of the issues that patients are raising. But on a, on a sort of more global scale, um, we, we have done, we're doing some work for 1415 in, in sort of three different areas. The first one is uh, de we've developed a sequin, which is um, around early adoption in those areas that are not yet um, using FFT, um, and also around increasing response rates. So obviously the more people we get responding, the better information we've got, the more ability we've got to be able to respond. And the planning guidance that went out actually requires commissioners to develop plans um, with their providers to address poor performance of patient experience. And I think that's a really valuable um, piece of work. It's not just about reporting. There's no point just reporting. It's about doing something with that information. And the national team um, and, the, and the national team that are actually out in, in the regions are working with area teams and CCGs to actually help them to develop those plans, which I think will be of benefit. And the other thing that's to say it's quite positive is that we have got... Um, be like subject matter experts in patient experience at looking particularly around mental health, learning disability, um, children, young people, older people. We've got people with particular expertise that are working nationally that can actually support areas. And then lastly, we're developing revised FFT guidance, um, which has got a much stronger focus on how to improve patient experience and also looking at how we get the most vulnerable people um, involved in, in feedback. So I think we're moving somewhere. Can I, just, can I just add that, um, just for the board's um, interest, we've just published today the <coughs> data, the, 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 the most recent data, and as of this moment, uh, more than 1.8 million people have participated in the Friends and Family Test, which I just think is Brilliant. amazing. Mm. Um, and as everyone also knows, we're rolling now Friends and Family Test out to uh, general practice in by December and then to all NHS-funded uh, care context by, the, by March 2015. So I, th I think we are at the beginning of something quite transformational. Thank you. So that was uh, really priority one, satisfied patients. Priority five, you can see there is a bit of data here about uh, improvements in patient reported outcome measures. It is provisional data. It's set out on the two charts that follow from where you've just been in your packs. Um, Bruce, I'm sure, will be happy to answer any questions on that if there are any, but it is provisional data and it doesn't show a dramatic movement. Uh, so uh, unless there are questions, I think we could... 
I just wonder if I could say a few words, actually, oh, uh, Paul, if you don't mind. These, <laughs> these things are, are PROMs, or patient reported outcomes, and we're the only country in the world that is doing this on, on, on a large scale. And <clears throat> we're still, if you like, in, in a phase of trying to understand exactly what they mean. But for the four conditions which we have here, which are operations for groin hernia, operations for varicose veins, knee replacement and hip replacement. We've, we've developed a set of questionnaires which have been running for a while now where people fill in um, what this means to them in their life using um, a very structured questionnaire before the operation and after. And the idea is to see how much things have, have helped them. And you might say, well, that's fine, you know, you could get that in the outpatient clinic from someone. But what this does is it brings a level of structure to it. And what it's doing is it's enabling us to link clinical outcomes or outcomes that clinicians think are good versus outcomes that patients think are good. And any surgeon will have had the experience of um, sitting in a clinic with somebody who tells them, Thankfully, not very often, but they're either worse after their operation or they know better. And then you send the person for a whole heap of investigations, and all the investigations come back and say the operation was fine. <coughs> and it might be fine for the surgeon, but it's been a disaster for the patient. So what this information does is it enables us to, to start thinking about those two things. So, for example, if you have a knee replacement and you're a plumber, it, and it means you can't kneel down afterwards, then actually that hasn't been a very successful procedure from your perspective. So we're, we're embarking on a new way of measuring success. In some case, we're still working out what some of this data means, but what we think that it'll lead us to, particularly as we dissect out hip replacements and, and knee replacements, it'll help us get to a position where we can select patients, um, better selection of patients, and a lot of that's about timing. So if you leave an operation for too long, it may not be as beneficial. If you do it too early, it's not beneficial. And skilled surgeons will do the right operation at the right time on the right patient. And I think this is helping us um, to get there. And we do have plans for more patient-reported outcomes that will be done in a much more simple way. But the most important thing about this, that seems to be this and the previous <coughs> one, is that the real value in this is the feedback directly to the clinicians, the ward, yes. the department itself. While it's interesting for us to look at some of it and there is an accountability yeah. issue here, the big value is what is in the hands of the clinicians and the patients. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, moving swiftly on. So priority seven concerns harm to patients and particularly the uh, reporting of MRSA, which is the red indicator that we're to say a little bit in a moment, and uh, CDF, which is the green indicator. They're both improving, is the important thing to say. They're both improving significantly and certainly taken over a two-year period, improving by a, a transformational amount. The only difference between the two is that we have a, an absolute standard on MRSA, which is a single instance of MRSA immediately triggers a red rating on that because no instance of MRSA is one that, that we would regard as acceptable. So uh, that's the, really the only difference between the two of them. But as you can see from the tables in the back, there is improvement on both. Um, Moving on to priority nine, which is really the constitutional rights, I'm going to ask Barbara just to say a couple of words about those of them which are not going to be covered under the emergency, the uh, any and uh, winter emergency uh, item later on in the agenda. Thank you, Paul. And um, perhaps I could take uh, everyone straight to section C because I just think um, it's easier to see um, some of the detail on this section C in the performance report, pages three and four what we call the, our at-a-glance um, national performance. Um, and uh, as you can see, that shows that uh, the NHS is, uh, continues to perform very well against um, particularly the access standards, which are, of course, part of a patient's constitutional rights um, to be seen uh, within a certain time, whether it's uh, in a &E department or for elective care um, or indeed uh, with our ambulances or with 111. Um, I will uh, say more about a &E performance um, and, and how we, our plans to ensure we continue to perform well when I um, do the update on winter. 
Um, but I, do, I would just add uh, any performances on uh, uh, page five. Um, we actually, uh, since this paper was written, we did achieve the 95% standard, which we think is the right standard for our patients this week. Um, and uh, board members will see from the bullet point that um, even in this, which is the most difficult quarter of the year, um, we are very close to achieving the standard we want for our patients. We're very optimistic that when we look back over the year, we will be able to say that we have achieved that standard. Um, there's no doubt that ambulance <coughs> performance um, uh, from the at-a-glance uh, uh, page is, is of concern because um, for the third consecutive month, we've, we've not um, met the standard for Category A uh, Red 1 calls. And, and similarly in December, um, we failed to meet the standard for um, the time critical category <coughs> red two calls. Um, but again, when I come on to winter planning, there's a lot going on in terms of supporting our ambulance trusts to deliver. Um, a lot of work going on with two particularly challenged trusts, East of England and East Midlands, through our partners in uh, the trust development. Um, and of course, we through our winter planning, we did uh, put additional sums of money in to support uh, these ambulance trusts who have had made considerable internal changes. Um, so although um, you know we're not complacent and we're not happy that our patients haven't had the right standards, um, there are a lot of actions in place uh, to support that. Um, moving on to page uh, seven, um, I would really like to. Uh, uh, identify how strong NHS 111 performance has been and continues to be. Um, performance measured not only in how quickly patients' calls are answered and whether patients abandon any of the calls as seen on the graph, um, but performance measured as in terms of patient satisfaction and the patient satisfaction rates from 111 are really very high. Um, and early indications from the data would suggest that 111 is now being successful in those places where it's been established for a while um, in helping to divert people who might otherwise have inappropriately uh, attended our overstretched uh, A&E departments. Um, since the paper was written, uh, the last two sites have gone live, so everywhere in the country is now uh, covered by 111. Um, the NHS direct uh, uh, contracts have now been transferred to the step-in providers um, and uh, we uh, you know, commend those step-in providers who have a very short space of time to get ready for, the, for maintaining um, the very good standards of care. Um, again, some, another area where we're not complacent, um, Easter is, uh, is, is approaching shortly um, when uh, the four days of Easter, Good Friday and Easter Monday, run all together at Christmas we had a gap between the two bank holidays we had some working days between the bank holidays and the weekend uh, which always makes it easier so um, we've got a lot in contingency in place to make sure that the 111 service is, uh, is, is good over the Easter period and then finally if I could just perhaps alert the board to our, our vigilant on referral to treatment standards in other words um, uh, managing um, the 18 week standards you where patients are um, entitled to be have their treatment commenced, whether it's an admission to hospital for elective care or it's, it's if they're not admitted within 18 weeks of being referred by the GP. Inevitably, um, the way our hospitals manage elective care is intrinsically connected with the um, uh, pressures of urgent care and acute care. Um, they've done the, our hospitals and our NHS staff have done a fantastic job this winter in. Um, ensuring those standards were met um, and they do continue to meet the 18 week standards um, but one or two of the indicators that we watch all the time in order to understand 18 weeks um, would suggest that some of our trusts are struggling um, to make to be sure to be well on the front foot in terms of continuing to meet this standard um, so there's a we've got a broad range of measures in place working with our partners in the trust development agency and um, with monitor um, to support those trusts on, on this particular aspect um, so, finally, before coming to the finance, there is the uh, priority number 10, which is building an excellent organisation. There's a paragraph at the top of page 4 in the main report on that, which I think is self-explanatory in terms of some of the improvements that we've seen. I don't know whether, Joe, there are any other comments you want to amplify on that? Um, I think we talked in sort of, well, I think at the last board meeting we took in detail the results of the October uh, barometer, so there isn't any new information there, uh, as it were. I think just to 
let the board know that the next barometer is planned for April and to report in June. Okay, and finally, finally then, um, on the performance metrics uh, finance, and that's all set out really from the halfway down on page four of the main report. Uh, as you'll recall, we did a big uh, in-depth uh, review uh, with the regions and area teams at month nine, as is customary, and the results of those are effectively the numbers that are set out both in the main report and a, a number of schedules later on in the pack. Um, Overall, the bottom line only moved by 14 million. So you might say, well, why do you bother to do a big deep dive? Well, it's kind of important to know whether that's real or whether that's uh, whether that's whether that's not. And we have been through that in depth, um, and that's the consequence. And the 702 million off surplus that you can see in the table uh, table three on page four is the end result of that. It is uh, 168 million better than the plan that we had at the beginning of the year. Um, within that, the CCG position has improved by 28 million to the number you see there. It's now 62 million over plan, really driven by 65 CCGs, mainly in the north and in central London, who are forecasting to overachieve by 193 million, and that more than offsets the 41 people, mostly in the Midlands and East, who uh, are under delivering on their uh, CCG targets. Uh, there has been happily no change in the number of deficit organisations as we've gone through into month nine. So we still have 24 of them forecasting it. Uh, the only real significant deterioration in performance at month nine was, I'm afraid, specialised commissioning. We've talked a bit about the challenges of specialised commissioning both in this meeting and in previous ones. Um, the uh, Disimprovement, uh, if I can call it that, was 64 million between uh, month eight and month nine. Uh, really, a number of area teams recognising activity risks uh, amidst what continues to be a very challenging circumstance of trying to monitor, let alone control activity. And I know Barbara's going to say a bit more about that when we come to the risk assurance framework, so I won't steal her thunder for now, but that's that's the only issue which, which is significantly negative in these numbers. It takes us to an exit deficit uh, in year of about 300 million, which is not mass massively out of line with what we assumed when we did the allocations, but it is, it is clearly a big challenge for that part of our organisation as we go forward. Um, at table four on page six, if you skip across the verbiage that I've just summarised in a couple of minutes, um, you can see uh, the passage through from the basic forecast I've just described to you uh, to the risk-adjusted forecast, which is where we add in factors which, uh, which might play into the forecast. Um, you can see there that if you see at the top, the 168 is what I've just described to you. The net operational risks and opportunity are effectively the CCGs and area teams' assessment of the risks that they're still facing, in particular with regard to activity, and the mitigations that they've got up their sleeves to deal with that uh, in the remainder of the year. Clearly, as the year becomes shorter, so does the quantity of risk. You'll remember at various stages of the year, that was a billion pounds plus in both directions, netting out that's now much smaller. Uh, we've got some continuing, I think, opportunities to see upsides in central running and programme costs this year, and then we have remaining reserves of 108, which would take, if all of that worked its way through, the overachievement of our financial performance this year from the 168 to the 281 by the normal measures by which the NHS has measured itself for years and years uh, to date. Uh, that leaves only the small complication of Treasury accounting, which has made my life and our life much more interesting uh, this year, if I can put it that way. Um, the Treasury requires us to ring fence savings on depreciation and not count that towards our core, uh, core measure of performance. And secondly, they have a slightly bizarre accounting rule, which means that you pay for provisions in performance terms in the year that you spend the money, rather than what most sensible bookkeepers would do, which is to charge it in the year in which you take the provision. And that's something which, again, the NHS has been slightly shielded from in the past, but because we're so big now in the system, it can't be something that's dealt with somewhere in, in Richmond House. So the 222 that you can see there as a negative is effectively taking out the benefit of depreciation savings, and it's also recording the fact that we've got costs of provisions uh, coming against that as 88 million of provisions, which is predominantly the continuing healthcare provisions that we've talked about a few times. So this year, we as NHS England have absorbed that as a kind of transitional measure to ensure the system didn't get destabilised by that. You'll recall when we did the allocations for next year, we put explicitly into the CCG allocation 250 million being our best estimate at the time of what the cost of that provision payment next year would be 
and it's quite appropriate then for the people who are accountable for continuing health care, i.e. the CCGs, to pay for that in 14-15 with the money that we've put into the allocations for that purpose. So that's the 222. And finally, we come to the topic which Ed uh, referred to slightly obliquely in his, in his audit committee report, which is the legacy, which has been even more entertaining than the Treasury in this particular year. So we received the data from the 160-odd senders approximately four months late and in a fairly parlous state at the back end of last year. And we've spent night and day and weekends, etc., since then trying to process that through to get to the proper impact of the inheritance, as it were, from the old system on our balance sheets. It's important partly because it will have an impact on our bottom line and partly because we've got to get all of this absolutely buttoned up in time to do the year-end accounting because it will come through our accounts as NHS England, uh, given the accounting directions on that. So it is a rather more exciting topic than I thought legacy was going to be when we started out this particular year. So at the time of writing this particular document at month nine, we were slightly surprised that the assessment of that looked as if it was going to be a negative impact of 152 million, which is the number you see here. And I think most of us looking at that thought that was a little bit of a surprising outcome because we thought, if anything, uh, there might be a degree of prudence in the year-end balance sheets of PCTs and SHAs as they went out of existence and therefore it would be more likely to be a positive. Uh, and as we have nerdled away, if that, that's the technical term that we use in accounting, at these legacy balances coming across, as we've removed duplications in them, as we've uh, sorted out some of the estimates that were within them, uh, that has transformed itself since writing this paper from 152 <coughs> of negative impact to, at the time of writing, a net positive impact of about 250 million. So quite a big... Well, I say quite a big swing in the volume of the balance sheets we're dealing with. That's a very small swing, but it does, it does put us on the, the side that we anticipated to be. So when you see the month 10 numbers, which we're going to treat the uh, Finance and Investment Committee to tomorrow, the 93 million that you see at the bottom of this table, negative, will look more like about a 300 positive variance to the plan we started off the year with. So, uh, which is a slightly happier circumstance. I just wish it hadn't taken us a month to to get to that, to that knowledge. There is still, as Ed said, some variation in all of that because we've still got quite a volume of uh, paperwork to get through in that. My current judgment is it's not going to get worse than that, at least not in any significant way. There are small issues which might turn in our favour and go a little bit beyond that, but more of that later when, when we've done the work rather than speculating on it. So really that's where I wanted to get to. Nothing very dramatic on the underlying finances of the organisation other than the specialised commissioning movement, which I guess is, is an ongoing issue that we've talked about a number of times. The legacy bounces around a little bit but has happened to end up in a relatively positive place as it currently stands. Um, happy to take questions, of course, on finance, as always. The report beyond finance then goes on to talk about the various deliverables that we have achieved during the course of the last month. It's also set out in a technicolour table in the middle of the, uh, appendix, the, uh, the appendix that you've got. Um, I wasn't proposing to delay us greatly on that because, uh, generally speaking, uh, we've either completed things in the last month or things have not got any worse and we are continuing to work on them. If anyone's got any particular questions on any of the individual items in those deliverables, of course, the relevant director will be happy to, to fill in on it. But at that point, I probably need to hand over to... Thank Martin. you, Paul. I'll invite the chair of the audit committee to... I think, uh, in terms of the, the performance report, it's um, um, a, a, a good report and... and uh, the, the work that Paul's doing and the team are doing on the, the legacy balance and other issues is fine. I would just like to say, though, and I should have said it under the audit committee, uh, we have to do a governance statement um, as part of our obligations and the annual report. And uh, that is, is going to have to be a pretty comprehensive uh, report, which will cover quite a lot of our performance activities. Um, and the very strong advice, I think, is that that has to be... Um, absolutely honest in terms of where we are as an organisation um, in, in um, moving from transition to full operation, uh, that it needs to be full uh, and disclose um, more rather than less. And um, it's a big challenge for the organisation to do that because it has to take into account the government statements of all the CCGs. Uh, and it has the added complication of a change in um, accounting officer, accountable officer, um, through the... Uh, period at which um, it needs to be uh, signed off as a new chief executive would need to sign it off in, in June. But off the back, 
David, of, of you having uh, signed it um, off as best you can at the end of March before you depart. So a big job there, and I think we'll need the collective efforts of the executive and the board to get that done. Um. Any further uh, comments for Paul? Well, let me just say, Paul, I mean, that's a very impressive performance, I think, for year-end, despite all the uncertainties and the unpredictabilities about it, and um, we're grateful to you. I assume there will be no other significant disruptions in the next three weeks. Thank you. I think I'll take that as a yes. Um, but actually, I think it's a very positive outturn, or as you would say, a negative disimprovement. Yes. <laughs> um, and we're Thank very you. grateful for the report. <laughs>